Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out. My name is Lisa Bunn. Uh, my colleague who's in the back, she can wave. She's going to be my little Miss Vanna. Her name is Raquel Poncho. She's going to step in if I have issues. I'm a COVID long hauler, so I have some memory issues. So she remembers. She's been with me from the beginning, so she will jump in if I get stuck. So let me tell you the representation of this um, logo here. This is actually my daughter and I. My daughter is 12 years old. She has autism. Uh, my artist, who was actually a former neighbor, I had her paint the rainbow colors to represent all individuals, regardless of their race, sexuality, disability, what have you. And then the heart represents uh, the love that I have for her. And then I will always have a hand for her. And I will hold her forever, as long as I am alive. So a little bit about myself. I'm not going to go in detail. I got a little bit of experience in law enforcement. Um, one of the main things that I did in my career was I was a traffic homicide investigator and a forensic mapper. So when I get into that part of the safety tactics, you will learn a lot of interesting things that I hope you can um, teach your children. And I am going to let Raquel, my Miss Vanna, come talk. Good morning, everybody. My name is Raquel Pancho. I am the Americans with Disability Vet Coordinator for the City of Tampa. My overall scope is to ensure the City of Tampa's programs and services are accessible to our community members with and without disability. And I'm delighted to be able to um, participate and help with this event. My background is actually in rehabilitation counseling. I've been working with individuals with disabilities since the early 1990s. I have a master's in rehabilitation counseling. So welcome everybody and I think you're going to enjoy this presentation. We've been actually offering it for several years and um, I usually learn something new each time that we are offering it. So thank you for your interest. So the first thing you're going to learn about is the City of Tampa Police Department Special Needs Registry. Uh, it says their, their motto is help us help you. You're going to learn about what information gets dispatched regarding your address, uh, what information the officer sees uh, in the route to your home, and the information that's on file that you will supply the agency about your child to help them, especially if your child is nonverbal. So why should you register your child with law enforcement? It will allow law enforcement the ability to access vital information about the event in case of an emergency at your home. So this is an example of the dispatch screen that law enforcement will see from the Tampa Police Department. The address is flagged and it'll stay flagged for a period of one year when they reach out to you to see if the address is still valid. And then right there is the detailed information that you supply to law enforcement about your child. So in here we created Johnny Doe. He's a white male, born January 1st, 2010. He's on the spectrum. He's nonverbal and may display stimming behaviors. An iPad will calm him down. So these are just some examples. Um, and this one, it provides he's attracted to water. And you describe the closest water source near your home. So if there's a group of officers in response to your home, then those backup officers know what address they need to go to to hopefully intercept Johnny before he gets submerged under the water. And this is Johnny. Has his description, his photograph, you know, the medical conditions he may have, the height, weight, and so forth. And it's up to you what information you're going to describe. What's definitely important is if there's birthmarks, especially if he's nonverbal, um, any large scarring or what have you. Now, this is something new that the registry just added this year. So, you know, kids with autism can drive. So you can actually register the vehicle. So if an officer decides to pull that vehicle over for a traffic law violation, they'll know ahead of time, okay, this driver may have autism. 
I wanted to add as well is that the session with Chevy Street will also cover individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing, individuals who have Alzheimer's and dementia, individuals who are diabetic as well. So it's not just limited to individuals who are autistic. You know, it's a broad range in case individuals have any limitations to be able to communicate with mom. And this is the information to register with Tampa Fire Rescue. And if you ever wanted to, you know, set up, so say your child is um, overstimulated by sirens, you can contact Zalavia Harley and set up a training session with her to see, to help the child cope with the sirens if you're able to get to that point. So this is the information if you live with reside within the Hillsborough County Sheriff's jurisdiction, this is how you would register through their project safe encounter registry. And it's going to have the, basically the same type of scenario the city of Tampa offers. Now this is something new the state finally did because I, you know, advocated it used to only have the designation for the developmentally disabled only for Florida ID cards. And, you know, I have a loud voice when I want to. And I said, well, individuals on the spectrum can drive. There's no reason they can't have that insignia on there. So thankfully, they finally added that. And they also made it where children as young as five years old can obtain a Florida ID card. However, if anybody has any type of disability whatsoever, it doesn't matter the age, they can get a um, an ID card issued. And then I also provided the link that your, your child's physician will have to complete in order to get that insignia on to their identification card. And here are some other ways to selfly disclose an individual's disability. If you're not able to get the identification card in enough time, there's a medical bracelet, you can get an ID lanyard, a dog tag, whatever works for your child. And let me let me disclose something ahead of time. Every, anything that you learn here today can act as a double edged sword. It may work for you. It may not. There may be a lot of pros. There may be a lot of cons. Whatever you learn here, it's going to be whatever works best for you and your family. And this is something I added food allergies. Um, I noticed there's a high rate of need for teachers. So there's a lot of substitute teachers that may not be aware of food allergies. This is something put it on their backpack or put it on their lunch bag because you never know, you know, that teacher may be out sick and there may be a sub that will be the one time the child gets exposed to a food allergy. So it's better to, you know, self identify as much as you can. Now this is the disability independence group they actually make wallet cards specifically for your child and this is just an example of a card of what they do so every card that they make is not the same so if you register with them and request an identification card a wallet card like this they can make it specifically for your child communication boards are very important this is an example for a card that USF offers. Um, and I supplied the link as well. You'll get a bigger, you know, visual from a, a desktop and then you can practice with your child. John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. This is their example. This is just a snippet. They actually made a communication booklet um, that is very good to have. I actually went to their training very great training. So if your child has a therapist or a counselor at the school, I strongly recommend any of these communication boards to practice with them. So if they ever come in contact with law enforcement, it won't be such a traumatic experience. You can actually, hopefully it'll be a smooth experience because they're informed. And the National Autism Association, this is another example of one of their communication boards on how to be in contact with first responders. Now here's social stories to practice safely at home. 
card at USF has two options here, one with a visual, a realistic visual aid, and then one that looks more of a cartoon. So whichever one your child responds best would be the one that I would use. And again, you practice it at home with your child, you give it to the therapist, you also give it to the school counselor, whatever, so they can constantly practice. So how do, how do you make your home safer to prevent elopement? Well, again, this is where that double-edged sword comes into play. A lockable chain door lock, a double cylinder door lock, a window lock, they're great tools, but you're going to prevent them from leaving the household, but then what do you do for a house fire? So this is something you have to take into consideration when you implement these uh, safety devices into your home, make sure you have a uh, evacuation plan and know when to use it and how to use it. And your child needs to know how to use it as well. Additional ways to prevent elopement. There's a sliding glass door lock, door fences, door fence locks. Make sure to use them, especially if you have a pool and let's say you don't have any kids. That doesn't, you also want to prevent neighborhood kids from accessing your property. So I strongly re recommend securing your property for that reason. You can install technological devices like a home alarm, a door, a ring doorbell camera system. Uh, the Tampa Police Department has a program called Project Rec, which also helps solve crimes by using your camera system in your neighborhood. And then, of course, getting a lockable medicine cabinet for the medications that they're not allowed to get into. And then if you have weapons. Um, I know the Tampa Police Department is bringing a handful of door, um, fire alarm, not fire alarm, firearm locks. So if you need one, please visit one of the vendors at the Tampa Police Department table to get one if you need one. But gun safes are not that expensive. I mean, they can get very, very expensive, but you can get one for at least 20 bucks to secure your firearms. And then informative stickers and signs that first responders see at your home. Again, a double-edged sword. First responders can see this, but so can predators. So you have to keep in mind where to put this, where you want it. Do you want it on the inside of the house? Do you want it on the outside of the car? You know, just be very cognizant what, how you use this, because you also have to think of, you know, predators and offenders out there. And Safety Net offers some tracking devices. This is one that requires um, satellite antenna. And the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, after this event, will be conducting a safety net um, demonstration with, act, with the actual tools. So they'll do a mock like a child eloping, and you'll see how that is used. But then you also, they're also, um, they have the GPS watches as well, as well. And if you can't afford um, to go that route to use safety net, there's other ways to use the technology. Verizon has the Gizmo Watch. Uh, Geobit uses other GPS tracks. So my daughter, she had sensory issues. She could not have items on her, her body if it wasn't symmetrical, but she really didn't like anything. Like when it was winter time for her to wear a jacket it was just, oof a lot of a lot of hell to deal with but you have to think outside of the box because there's other ways that you can use to help track um apple uses the find my apple device and then life 360 the good thing about life 360 so say you know for instance my sister has apple device i have an android device both of us can log into this app and we can track. So let's say you go on vacation to visit family. Everybody can get on that Live 360, and then we know where the child is at. Now, this is something that I had to think outside the box, going back to my daughter with the sensory issues. 
So I actually had custom made tattoo, temporary tattoos made, and I would put it on the back of her arm. So she didn't see it. Well, she didn't, so she wouldn't grab it, try to rub it off. So if we were at a theme park and we got separated, somebody knew to call me or my husband. Using pedestrian crosswalks. This is a pet peeve of mine. Most of the fatals I've investigated in my career could have been prevented. Probably, I, I would say 85% at least. Using a crosswalk is so important. Um, teach your child to look left, right, left. Listen, feel for the traffic. Now that technology has expanded with these um, uh, smart cars where it's hard to even hear them, if your child is hearing impaired, I would go to a Tesla dealership, get with the manager and say, hey, can I practice with my child in your parking lot, get in a safe environment so they can be familiar with how electrical cars sound or feel or figure out a way to make them safe. And then especially at night that Halloween's approaching, um, thankfully my agency, you will be getting goodie bags at the end of this presentation that you'll have a slap, uh, slap bracelet that's also reflective and it lights up. Lighting safety. I guarantee if everybody in here walked in their neighborhood, they can find something wrong with their neighborhood and they can actually make it safer. So in this area, you have a TECO light, which is Tampa Electric or DOT, which is the Florida Department of Transportation. That is what a TECO light looks like, and then identification and a DOT identification. If you see tree limbs obstructing the lights, you can report that. Have the city, have the county, have them trim that back so the lighting is actually effective, so motorists can see you and your family walking home at night. I guarantee if you walk in your neighborhood, you will find something wrong, whether it's a sidewalk that's lifted and it's a trip hazard. I mean, I, I guarantee you, you can always report something. Now, <clears throat> here's some additional safety strategies. I do not recommend, you know, I call it tattooing the, 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 uh, their property loudly, because again, going back to the sexual predators, my hang tags, when I go pick up my kids, do not have their first names. I'm not gonna give the sexual predator the advantage of knowing my kid's first name. It has my last name because an adult that says, you know, bun, 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 my kid's not gonna turn around. But if they know my child's first name, they're gonna turn around. I have luggage tags on their backpacks, just so, you know, first responders or whatever, but you can't see it by walking by them. Somebody actually has to grab the tag to look at the information. Again, if the child is nonverbal, non this is very important to have on them. And then internet safety tips. If you're not familiar with ways to block certain websites, do not give your child an electronic device. Find somebody who does, go to the local library, get educated, go to um you know uh best buys geek squad get try to be familiar but if you're not confident don't give them the tablet because predators are out there they're going to find a way through video games or you know any which way possible so this is the website to locate if you have a sexual predator or offender in your neighborhood so this is what the page is going to look like so at the time I worked for Tampa Police Department. So this is the address for headquarters in downtown. So that's what it looked like for headquarters. So when it shows a tent, that means they're transient. They don't have a stationary address. And this, is, this was the closest um, offender to headquarters. And then that's when, if you were to click on the tent, this is what would show up. So if you do have an offender or a predator in your neighborhood, definitely show your child this. Drive by the house, 
show them the vehicles that are there. Don't treat it as taboo. The more information they have, the more self-aware. So if God forbid they ever become alone, they're aware, oh my God, that's a bad man or a bad woman. I can't be near them. And these are common tricks used by these type of individuals to lure them. Hi, I've lost my dog, can you help me? Would you like to see my puppy that's inside of my dog? Hi, Johnny. And that's if they've reconned your area and now that they know Johnny's name because you put Johnny's name across his backpack, they'll say, your mommy told me you need help and I have to pick you up. Or would you like some candy? This is just some common tricks that they use. And I'm going to let my agency take over. So I have two presenters, uh, Jordan Culpepper and Bryn Card. When I go back, we have three locations. We have a Lutz, Wesley Chapel, and St. Pete location. All three locations have clinics where we offer ABA, speech, and OT therapies. Our Lutz location also has a private school and an inclusive daycare. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Culpepper. I am an assistant behavior analyst with Achievability Therapy, um, and I have been in the ABA field for about eight years. And then um, I'm going to go go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Bryn. I've also been in the field for about eight years. I'm the BCBA in the early intervention clinic at the Lutz location. So to start, we're gonna really go over the importance of identifying our body parts. So the Disabled World News reports that 80% of women and 30% of men with developmental disabilities will experience sexual assault. Of these, only 3% are ever reported. With that, research also shows that while 89% of children know the names of body parts, only 10% know the correct names for their genitalia. By not teaching the correct names or even not speaking about these topics with our kids, we're teaching them that it's off topic. It's not something that we speak about. It's something lighthearted or even maybe fun if we use nicknames. So just think, if your child tells their teacher that their uncle touched their kitty or their flower, the teacher might just think that they have a pet or a garden at home. With that, we also want to make sure that we're not teaching good touch versus bad touch. We really want to focus on teaching appropriate versus inappropriate. Why? Because if we think when your child climaxes for the first time, that's not going to be associated with a bad touch. So we really want to focus on that appropriate and inappropriate. By appropriately identifying our body parts, we're going to promote boundaries and understanding. We're going to make our kids less vulnerable, less susceptible to abuse and really eliminate the barriers and challenges of reporting and even being able to identify um, if assault or abuse has happened. So kind of going into our next topic, we're going to go over um, how to identify safety personnel. So when we're teaching how to respond to safety personnel, we want to also teach things so example, if we're going to teach about a police officer, teaching things like keeping our hands out of our pockets, um, following directions, disclosing that they have a disability, not to run away, or to learn to approach and who to approach. Um, and then Bryn's going to dive deeper into this topic. So a lot of the focus of ABA is repetition, practice, and then kind of reinforcement for going through that over and over again. Kids with autism typically learn better when going through the same material multiple times. So in an ABA setting, we might start working at the table, looking at pictures of strangers versus community helpers. We're going to use lots of examples so they don't just think, oh, we showed them one picture of a police officer, so all police officers look like this. Using lots of examples 
of the materials. We might use pictures of people they really do know from their clinic, from their daycare, from their school, um, whatever it may be, and go through specific questions about what is okay or not okay scenarios to be in with these various people. We use a lot of role play to promote fluency and what to do in a scenario if a community helper approached you versus somebody you do know versus um, somebody you would call a stranger. So as Bryn discussed, we really want to teach who is this person to me? Are they a friend, a family, an acquaintance, a community helper, a stranger? And then also teach what are my verbal and physical boundaries for each of these different types of people? And then the last thing we wanted to touch on for this specific topic was making sure that we are teaching our kids their first name, their last name, their parents' phone number, their address, to disclose any allergies that they may have. So again, we use a ton of repetition, a ton of practice with this. For kiddos who might be nonverbal, we make sure that this information is a in their communication devices if they have one, and that they are fluent in being able to answer those questions on their communication device. Um, one of the problems that I do hear a lot in this specific realm would be that the communication devices can be bulky or big and parents don't like bringing them into the community always, but I make sure to emphasize to parents that the communication device needs to go with them. If they were to get lost or separated, that's their only way of responding their name or their parents' phone number. Um, and then making sure that the kids are also fluent in who to give this information to. So looking for somebody in a uniform if they're lost, going to a police officer, making sure they're fluent with those people, and then making sure they know do not tell this information to people who just come up to you and ask for it. Um, the next point we we're going to talk about was responding to firearms and poison. So we teach kids this, what is dangerous with real life scenarios. So we might use pictures or descriptions of these poisons or firearms or what it, whatever it is with excuse me, real life pictures. We talk about what could happen if they touch this, if they got into this, maybe a picture of the medicine cabinet or the cabinets under the sink, teaching the kids that these aren't juices, these aren't something. So giving them the real life pictures and scenarios of that situation. We talk about what an adult can help them with so that they know medicine itself isn't bad. We don't wanna make medicine seem scary, like, oh, don't touch that, but it needs to be with mommy or daddy. Like they can give it to me, I'm not getting it myself and then giving them examples of what safe activities they can do on their own are. And then moving into responding to firearms, the US Department of Health and Human Services reports that gun violence is the leading cause of childhood death. And we're currently in a time where there are more gun owners than ever, which means more opportunities for our kids to be exposed. So we want to be teaching them what do we do in the presence of a gun and how do we respond. These are going to decrease the likelihood of injury to self or others. How do we teach these skills? We're going to really focus on role playing. So using props for safe teaching, modeling steps like stop if you see a gun, don't touch, um, leave the area and tell an adult immediately. Um, the NRA also provides child-friendly video modeling through their Eddie the Eagle program. And then Bryn's going to go ahead and finish up our presentation with safety directions. So safety directions, just like everything else I've talked about, we teach with a ton of repetition, so a lot of trials over and over again. Typically, I like to teach kids to stop, to come here, and to stay with me first. So when I'm teaching for stop, for example, we might start with what we would call in our fields most to least prompting. So holding their hand while we're saying stop or like touching them on the shoulder so that they're pairing the motion of physically stopping with the word stop and a lot of practice with that. Um, we want to do it in a very safe setting at first, so in the home. Once they're getting more fluent with it in the home, we can start moving it to maybe like a fenced in yard or a neighborhood walk, but making sure that they're pairing that word with the motion to start before we're bringing it into community settings. Another way I like to teach it is using fun games. So maybe playing red light, green light with the kids, things like that, where they think it's entertaining. They don't think that this is a boring task to do, but they're still learning those safety instructions in a controlled manner. 
Um, for any of the resources that we've mentioned today or kind of examples of what we use to teach, we'll have them all at the resource table in the back. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So I want to add to what they're explaining, um, learning the, the phone number and the name and all that. Um, I recently had an experience where my daughter actually eloped. Uh, my house is set up like Fort Knox, but we were on vacation. Didn't think that, um, and we went to the same place we go every year. So she wasn't out of routine in the essence of she knew going. But in this particular essence, my husband is a cancer survivor and he forgot his medication. So didn't think that where we were staying was such a retirement community that everything closes at five o'clock. So we weren't able to get an emergency uh, refill on his prescription. So that particular day, um, the ocean had swallowed my son's hat. And I am all about safety, obviously, I'm putting this presentation. So one of the things is skin safety. So I make the whole family wear the big sombreros, you know, to, to shade our bodies the best that we can. And I explain to my husband, okay, when we wake up in the morning, you know, we'll go get your prescription and get, you know, our son a new hat. Well, we were exhausted from the beach and 9.30 in the morning, banging on the door. My daughter had gone out looking for my husband because while we were still sleeping, he's like, well, I'll go run and get the medication real quick. She was gone for 30 minutes. Let me tell you, having that feeling and that 30 minutes, it brought me back to being a law enforcement officer where I was in high speed pursuits. And I was thinking, oh my God, in 30 minutes, I can be in three counties. There would have been no way I could have found my daughter, but thankfully she knew to stay close. She knew her phone number. She knew the name. She knew how to come back to the room to get us. But that's something you also have to think of again, outside of the box. When you travel, you have to have a plan as well. Make sure you, you know, so let me, so the next vacation we went to, I gave the staff her picture, her information, my information, my husband's information. So it was not going to happen again. So if staff members saw her out and about by herself, they knew to reach me. So the next speakers are from CARD. So I am Denise Barnes and I work for the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, along with Lee, who will introduce herself um, in a few slides. And CARD is a state funded um, discretionary project. We're funded through the Department of Education and we provide services to every resident in the city, in the state of Florida, to every school in the state of Florida, to every employer in the state of Florida, to every agency in the state of Florida. If you live here or visit here and you need some resources or information about autism, CARD can typically do that. Now, we often get um, confused with this other CARD and their title is the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Remember that S on the end? Put two lines to it, that means they charge you cash for your services, okay? So we're <laughs> the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, not disorders. Um, we provide whatever a, a person on the autism spectrum needs in regards to information, resources, coaching, modeling, supports. Um, we provide that same thing to families. We can help if it's a new diagnosis and you don't know what to do, we can guide you through that process. We can do um, whatever you want in regards to autism, in regards to safety. We have our um, consultants are um, broken up into early age, school age, and adult. And so we cover the lifespan. You're never too old for our services. You're never too young for our services. And safety is paramount for us. We have a safety committee that does a lot of safety things that we do. We partner with a lot of other safety agencies. So going back to that, the USF card office is located here in Tampa, but we provide services to several locations and I'll show you that slide. You can call us, you can email us, or you can go to our website and you can hit contact us. And so, as I said, I'm Denise Barnes. I'm from Michigan originally. I've been with CARD since 2013. And 
I've been in the disability field for over 30 years. It's my passion. I was in another field and I was like, I can't handle this. And I went and worked in the group home and I've been in love ever since. <laughs> so this is what I do. In addition to working for Carter, I also work for MCIC as the employment coordinator. Um, I also have my master's in rehabilitation and community inclusion um, from another state, but the same school colors. So the, our card office provides services for 14 counties, and these are the 14 counties that we provide services to. It goes from Pasco County all the way down to Collier County, and then over to Hendry and Glades and back up. So if you're in that catchment area, then you would receive services from the USF card office. If you're in another area, you can also, where this map is found on our website, or go to card Florida, they'll give you a map of all the card centers and you pick where you live and they'll give you the contact information for your local card center. And so I'm going to talk about two things, um, some factors that pose a risk for your child and we're also going to talk briefly about water safety. So know that every child on the spectrum is unique um, or any child with any neurodiverse diversity is unique and they're all different. But children on the spectrum tend to have um, a higher incidence of wandering. And wandering can also be called elopement. It can be called bolting. It could be called exploring. But it's when that adult or child gets out of the safety of their caregivers or their providers or their homes and no one knows where they are. That's higher for children who um, need sensory, they need high sensory input. They're sensory seekers. Um, it can be for those who bolt, it's usually due to they heard a noise or saw something that startled them and their first reaction is to take off 90 miles an hour. They don't look to see who's coming. They don't look to see where the traffic is. They don't look to see a mom and dad is following me and coming. All they're thinking of is I need to get out of this spot right here and they just take off. Um, and then a lot of them end up being lost. And so there are Wandering and elopement risk, you want to make sure that you know if your child has a tendency to wander, you want to know the reason. Are they sensory seeking? Are they explorers? Some of us are just natural explorers. Some of you are natural explorers, okay? Um, the sensory seekers, you usually there's a parent that was also a sensory seeker. That parent might have jumped out of an airplane. They go bungee jumping. Those are sensory seekers. One or more of your kids are gonna have those tendencies as well. So you wanna make sure you add that to their diet of activities so that they can have that fulfilled. They may know like Elena did, she knew her dad was going somewhere and so she went looking. The routine was broken, okay? There's many examples of children who go looking for parents who were late from work or you moved or they got a new car and they may refuse to get in that car and start walking because they're like, that's not the car you drove me off today in. So they won't get back in it. So know what the, those elopement risks are and come up with a plan. You want to make sure that your neighbors know that plan, your local police officers know that plan, your kids who are not on the spectrum need to know that plan, okay? Some kids are overwhelmed by sensory input. Those are bolters or it's just too, too much sensory overload. They may either bolt or they'll shut down. And the shut down may look like crying. It may look like crawling into a corner, having a meltdown. It may look like a temper tantrum. It can look like a, little, a lot of different things, but it's due to the sensory input. It could be the lights, it could be the sounds, it could be the perfumes, like I have this mask on because people have on too many perfumes today. And this is the only way to protect myself from getting a headache and a migraine, okay? So know what your child's sensory input limits are and put accommodations in place wherever you go. Don't assume they handled it yesterday, they can handle it today. Make sure those accommodations are always in place wherever you go to reduce the risk of elopement for that individual. Some individuals don't know who's a safe person and who's an unsafe person. As parents, as caregivers, as teachers, um, as card staff, we have to teach kids to know the difference. And one of the ways to do that is having them identify their immediate family, their community members that are active in their life, that includes teachers, doctors, 
their cousins, their grandparents, their neighbors, okay? And then anyone outside of that, if the, well, above that would be um, emergency support personnel, have them identify those, and then they know anyone outside of that circle that I can immediately identify may not be a safe person for me. And so they know to distinguish between the two, okay? They may not know if a person is nice or not, okay? That's difficult for some of us to tell because smiling faces do what, <laughs> okay? So don't expect a child who has an intellectual development or disability to be able to tell the difference when we can't tell the difference. So you prepare your child for those risks. So if someone approaches them that's outside of their circle of support, they know to look for one of those emergency community personnel to go get some support from. You have to teach them that. It doesn't come by osmosis. Try as you might, I've been trying to learn a lot of things over my life by osmosis and it does not work. They have to be taught, okay? Make sure that your neighbors and everyone knows that children are attracted to water. It could be the shininess. It could be because it's wet. It could be because when they go in the water and get under the water, it's very, very quiet. And it's like a glove that's enveloping in them. And it feels very secure. It could be a lot of different things. The same reason some of us like the water, okay? It's very common. But you should know where all water sources are when you're going out somewhere. They may like to explore and touch things and taste everything. So you have those. You have those who, it's a sensory thing. The same way when most kids between the ages of six and 18 months, everything they pick up first goes to their, that's how they explore. That's how they learn. And some individuals tend to do that a little bit longer. So you have to be careful of what's in the environment to make sure that they don't get poisoned, to make sure they don't choke. Teach them what's good to pick up, what they're allowed to and what not. If you want to avoid in the house, especially poisons, keep your poisons locked. Card has cabinet locks or your poisons. Nowadays, orange juice looks just like pine salt. Okay? Vinegar looks just like ammonia. They're now the same color. So you need to keep those things locked and separated, okay? Um, and then you can, on our website, we have some poisoning tips that um, you can handle. We tell every parent to learn first aid CPR. So if your child chokes, you know how to handle that. Um, there are people who are fascinated by dangerous objects or activities, thrill seekers. They may like shiny things. They don't care that that police officer has his hand on his gun, they see that shiny badge. So you have to be careful about things like that and teach your kids the difference. What's appropriate for them to reach for when it's shiny, what's not appropriate for them to reach for when it's shiny, okay? Whether it's your child or your grandchild or someone else's child that you're caregiving, you have to teach those things. Um, they need to know, um, most individuals on the spectrum or whoever intellectual disabilities aren't afraid of much unless they've had a traumatic experience with it, okay? So you have to teach them about animals. You have to um, be survey the environment, know what's out there, okay? So that you can prevent them from being hurt um, when they're messing around with objects or certain activities. You want to make sure that you talk to your child, however they communicate, whether it's by pencil, paper, augmentative communication device, sign language, every child should have a way to communicate with you. You want to teach them about bullies. Talk to them about bullies. Find out what happened on their day. If your child is older and has a device, text that child. Because remember, especially individuals on the spectrum, they only do needed conversation. How was your day to them is not a needed conversation. That's water cooler talk. They don't engage in water cooler talk. So you may text your child and say, what did you learn today? Did anything exciting happen today? Okay? And they may text you back and say, well, Johnny told me if I didn't give him my lunch, he was going to punch me. That's the instance where you need to get up, stop doing what you do, want to go address that with your child and tell them what to do and follow up with the school. But you have to communicate with your children. Um, there are individuals who are on the autism spectrum and other things who, what we call, have um, difficulty knowing if they're hungry, if they're in pain if they're injured. And so for those children, you need to put in schedules where you do body checks. 
so you can check to see if they're angry. They're not going to know their arm is broke. Whereas you might be screaming to the top of your lungs because of the pain. To them, they're like, oh, something's not right, but I can't figure out what it is. So you have to be able to help those individuals with those things. You also need to um, make sure that they have some functional communication device. Communication is not just verbal, it's nonverbal. Okay, so if they need to use ASL, as I said, augmented communication devices, their tablet, which is our, which are cheaper and freer, or written word, but find a way for your child to be able to communicate. Now we're going to move into some water safety, and there's just three tips I want to leave you with um, outside of what's already on this card. Okay, you want to make sure that as a parent or a caregiver that your child is always close to you when they're near the water, especially if you're at the beach or a pool. You want to um, use water, the, the five layers of prevention. You want to assess their risk for wandering and drowning. Can they swim? If they can't swim, then you need to get them swim lessons. A secret though is if they refuse to get in the water, have them watch swim lessons. Children on the spectrum still learn. I know of a boy who watched his three siblings take swim lessons. He didn't want to take swim lessons. He just sat and watched. The first day he decided to get in the water, he swam better than his siblings. <laughs> and he had never done it. So make sure they're exposed to that. Um, you want to implement other drowning prevention strategies, such as the one door and door alarms. You want to have a lock on the pool. You want to make sure there's no toys in the pool area that may attract them to it so they'll reach for those and fall in. You want to make sure that they wear bright bathing suits. If your child has on a red, dark blue, or dark green bathing suit and they go into the ocean or into a pool, they're harder to find when you're scanning the water. They need to have on bright colors, not the dark colors. You want to take or pledge for water safety. Um, many agencies have water washer tags, water washer badges. We probably have some on our table in the back. Those are free. That's where when you're going to the beach or the pool, someone volunteers to take a 15 minute session where they're doing nothing but watching the people in the water. They're not smoking. They're not eating. They're not on Facebook. They're not on TikTok. They're just watching the people in the water for 15 minutes. And when their 15 minutes is over, they pass that to the next responsible person. So then that person now can go play and engage and somebody else is watching all of those in the water. If nothing ever happens, that's fine and great. But by chance something happens and you don't have a water watcher, who's calling 911? Who's getting the lifeguard if there's not a lifeguard? Who's jumping in the water? Who knows where Johnny was when the last time you saw them walking around the pool? So you need to have a water watcher at all times. You want to, um, as I said, cut out any distractions and you also want to get CPR certified. We don't care if it's hands only CPR. I understand you don't want to put your mouth on nobody you don't know. Learn CPR. Hands only CPR means you're just doing chest compressions. You can even teach your kids how to do the, the chest compressions. Everyone in your house needs to know how to do hands only CPR at the least. It saves a life, okay? You want to, we have on our water, um, this Josh Deodor card in the back, we have this, the steps for learning hands only CPR. It's very simple to do. There's free videos on YouTube that teaches you how to do that too. And then we also have a water guardian pledge that we would love you guys to commit to so that you can keep you and your family safe when you're in the water. Thank you. I'm Lee Daly and I'm a card consultant. I work on the early childhood team and I'm the mental health lead at card and I also work on the autism friendly business project. Um, my background is in special education and social work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what you all can do to get in touch with CARD, to get some of our services, and to talk to consultants, talk to our resource office. A lot of times, the first time parents get their news that they have a child on the spectrum, they're bombarded with a bunch of alphabet soup. You know, they get ASD and ADHD and uh, IFSP and go get ABA and you know you're you're going to be confused by a lot of it so we're here for you to walk you through the process kind of provide you with a crash course if you need it um, 
And so to register, to be able to have a consultant speak, you know, speak with you, um, you can actually scan this QR code or you can um, type in the HTTPS address into your browser and that will help you to start the process. But you don't have to wait to register. You can actually just call CARD. Um, we did have the information up before of how to get in touch with CARD. It's very helpful to have somebody to call when you want to find information on something. And we do have a very, very good resource database that is uh, kept up by our constituents. So when they find a dentist that they really love and works great with kids on the spectrum, they tell us and we put that on our list. So we don't have every single dentist in the Tampa Bay or the 14 counties. We have the dentists, we have the ABA providers, we have you know, uh, the uh, speech pathologists who have been recommended by our constituents. So that's, that's one of the values of it is like really tapping into that knowledge. We also have a lot of resources for you. So for instance, we have an e-library or an electronic library that you can download books from. Books on just about everything related to autism, including books written by people on the autism spectrum, uh, both children and adults, as well as a, a physical library within our card area at USF. So if you happen to be close to USF, you want to look at some actual hard copies of materials, you can do that as well. But if you're further away, it's actually fine to just get the e-copies if they're available. Some books aren't yet in the electronic format, so we try to purchase the ones that uh, aren't yet so we can get them for you. So you can scan this code to register for the library. And there's also uh, funds that are created to assist families to attend conferences or to have us purchase things for families that are necessary for safety. For instance, there is some funding that we have for the safety net um, bracelets. They're not inexpensive, um, but if a, if a family has a child that elopes and does not have a provider working with them to try to address that we try to make sure that we get them linked up with the resources that they need so they can protect that child and keep them safe. Um, so we'll talk more about that, but the the four autism uh, license plates are actually a way to sort of contribute to that fund. So if you're interested, you can check out that on our website as well. And on our website, we also have a section of resources, and this is one of the big ones, which is the safety section. We have put together a kit which is invaluable for families who have children who tend to elope and do things that are not so safe. So we have uh, items that will provide some guidance and support. Uh, you might see the stop sign there. We have a bunch of different laminated stop signs that you can then add to uh, cabinets or doorways that you would like your child to learn to wait and stop and get access to through you. We also have door alarms, a, a pair of door alarms that are in there. So you, if your child tends to go out while you're not looking, you'll at least hear that door alarm going off. Um, there's a number of informational packets and resources in this kit that will help you understand the necessity to provide some swimming lessons or water safety classes, uh, poison prevention. Um, the communication card that we talked about earlier is also in that kit. So if you have a need for this kind of thing, please register with CARD. Let us know what your needs are. We'll talk to you about what your specific needs are walk you through some of these resources and get you connected with a consultant who can help you. I'll pass it along to the Crisis Center. Good morning. My name is Nicole Collins and I'm with the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay. I work as a victim advocate for sexual assault. The Crisis Center has two locations that hold our sexual assault department, one in Bears and the other at Ruskin. The sexual assault department is 24-7 on an on-call basis, meaning that if it's not during business hours, which is Monday through Friday, um, typically 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., we can respond at any time during the day via if you were to call 211 due to a sexual assault, 
we can have a nurse and an advocate come out to respond to sexual assault. The sexual assault department offers victim advocacy and here the victim advocates do a few things. One is when they respond to safe exams, sexual assault forensic examinations. I will explain that more later on. And then advocates also provide accompaniment to any sexual assault related court dates or medical appointments, as well as help um, survivors of sexual assault report to law enforcement if they're interested. And we also provide emotional support and validation and referring our um, survivors to services and care coordination and counseling, which is also offered by the crisis center. So just a little about myself. Um, as previously stated, my name is Nicole. I have my bachelor's degree from USF in psychology and a master's degree from USF as well in criminology. I am a certified sexual assault victim advocate and my special population where I uh, typically conduct outreaches and provide services to is child welfare systems and teens. So today I will be talking um, about two different things. First, I will be going over consent what it is and when an individual lacks consent. So an easy way to remember um, consent is FRIES. F for freely given, R for reversible, I for informed, E for enthusiastic, and S for specific. So um, a lot of us have a good idea of what consent is, but it's important to know when an individual lacks consent. So if an individual is under the age of 16, they lack consent. An individual who lacks consent is someone who is over the age of 16 and under 18 if the offender is 24 or older. A vulnerable adult can also lack consent in certain situations. So someone who is a, so someone who is a vulnerable adult due to a physical disability can provide consent to sexual activity. Someone who has a cognitive disability and is under the care of a legal guardian is unable to provide consent. So this is someone who can't um, advocate for themselves or is legally under the care of someone else. They cannot give consent. The next thing I will be talking about is unique challenges for vulnerable adults and children as well. So a lot of times it is difficult to see warning signs and it's difficult to know due to lack of communication or unable to meet common ground communication. One difficulty we see in knowing if um, a child or vulnerable adult has been sexually assaulted is that sometimes they cannot report due to the abuser um, being a caregiver role. So this can be a parent or someone who provides um, medical care to them. It's difficult for them to kind of separate themselves and report or get help. Another unique challenge is, is they may not be aware or understand the assault and abuse. So, Vulnerable adults, as well as children, may not recognize that the relationship is inappropriate, especially if it's been going on for some time or if they've been coached to think that this is how it works or this is how my dad or mom shows love. They may not even recognize that they're in danger or being taken advantage of. Another unique challenge is they may be unable to convey assault or abuse due to the disability. So this is um, similar where they just don't understand what's happening to them to be bad or inappropriate. And then the abuser may take away access to means of communication. So if mom or dad or even um, a medical caregiver is with the child or vulnerable adult 24-7, they may not allow them to have access to other resources. The individual may not see a therapist or be alone when they go to a doctor where they can feel comfortable and report or have means to a phone to call for help. So those are unique challenges we see because as sexual assault victim advocates, we are able to provide resources but it is difficult to connect those individuals in need to the resources. So here are some ways we can help um, bridge the gap in connection and get people the resources they need. So being able to identify warning signs is very important to help being provide help. So some warning signs is disclosure or hints. So if a child or vulnerable adult is hinting to something or talking more about a certain topic or seeing interest, this could be a warning sign. Bruising, infection, and or scarring can also be a warning sign that something is um, not right or an appropriate activity may be taking place. Genital pain, um, this can be a sign as well. From transmitted infections, 
um, can be a sign and as well as psycho psychosocial behaviors. So one of the main, um, one of the signs we can see is when a child or a vulnerable adult is, starts to have triggers. So triggers may be on the extreme side and panic attacks, but they also can be um, smaller, like when a certain smell makes them unhappy or they're not uncomfortable with a certain sound or a movie. These are also triggers to look out for. Sometimes the signs can be very small, sometimes it can be bigger. So just being aware and knowing how to identify these signs can be very helpful to connecting people to our services. So now I will be briefly talking about a SAFE, which is the Sexual Assault Forensic Examination. So one of the services offered on a 24-7 basis at the Crisis Center is our SAFE exams. This is where an individual who wants to report sexual assault or doesn't want to report to law enforcement, who just wants to go through the process, can come and receive services. It is 24 seven and the crisis center specifically offers it for 13, year old, 13 years old and over. So here we have um, a SANE, which is a sexual assault nurse, as well as an advocate come and respond and they would take evidence. They don't do anything the individual is uncomfortable with. So it's on a, what they need or what they feel ready for basis. This is where our advocate then goes over the services we provide after whether they want to continue to keep up to date with the advocate so they can go to court with them or trial or an injunction or anything they feel they need that extra support can really be beneficial to them during their process. And that's all I have for today. Our um, sexual assault team will be at the exhibit later giving more resources that both the sexual assault services offer as well as the other resources at the crisis center. Thank you. Good morning. How's everyone doing? It's a lot of wonderful information, isn't it? So hopefully today you're feeling empowered. My name is Susan Morgan. I am from Grace Point. And Grace Point is uh, in the Tampa Bay area. We've been here almost 75 years. And we are all things healthcare. We're mostly known for our mental health, mental wellness. And one of the things we like to focus on is mental wellness. Mental health has a stigma and oftentimes is seen as something negative. But when it comes to mental wellness, we're all on that journey, right? Uh, so as I already mentioned, my name is Susan and I am born and raised here in Tampa, Florida. And one of the things that I love about my city is uh, how much it's grown, not the traffic, um, but all the wonderful resources that we have here. We're fortunate in Tampa that we do have a lot of resources. Um, there are some communities that um, do not have as many and they have lots of wait lists. So we're very fortunate to have all of these amazing organizations here uh, to support children and families in our community. I would say for myself, this topic is very dear and close to my heart. My sister had disabilities and when my parents passed, I became her caregiver. And so I know the unique challenges, both as a caregiver, a family member, but then also watching a child grow into an adult um, the wonderful experiences and perceptions in the world that she had, but also those challenges. So I would just like to start off with that no matter what abilities your child has, helping them have mental wellness is the utmost importance. Children and adults oftentimes with children and adults with disabilities oftentimes are more at risk for um, having challenges with their mental health. And some of those reasons might be is because they have more stress that they have to deal with on an ongoing basis. And some of those things might be similar to abuse, neglect, bullying, restraint, and it's sometimes uh, the trauma that might trigger a mental health. Now, some research shows us and has told us that up to 30, some have gone as high as 50 to 60% of children and adults with disabilities will have a mental health challenge in their life. And some of that is as a result of the societal pressures of trying to fit in and knowing that maybe they're different than their peers. And as I mentioned, some of the traumas as uh, the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay just mentioned a few moments ago. Some of the common mental health diagnoses in children with disabilities often center around anxiety, attention deficit disorder, ADHD, as I just mentioned, conduct disorders, 
You might also um, get into the realms of OCD, and certainly we cannot forget depression. The challenge sometimes is getting caught between two systems of care. With children and adults with disabilities, oftentimes we're so focused on the medical aspects of their lives that we don't pay attention to the mental health. Um, and a lot of times children with disabilities have multiple things. They might have medical conditions and re as well as learning disabilities, or today we're speaking a lot about autism, but you're in that system of care. And then we wanna treat mental health in a separate system of care. So it sometimes causes those complexities in treatment because oftentimes people are focused on the stabilizing and making sure their kids have the right medications and treatment. So they're in this silo and they don't always make it to the mental health silo. So we have learned best practice is when possible to have integrated care so that the professionals that are treating your loved ones also are mindful of mental health and those conditions and how it might impact their everyday lives. Um, I'm sure many of you um, have seen when your children um, or loved ones that have disabilities, when they're doing well, when they're feeling well, and when they're not feeling well, meaning with their mental health. If they were at school, as was mentioned earlier about bullying, uh, maybe they don't have the words to come home and, and express it. So you have to have those targeted questions, um, but you can see their affect and they wanna isolate and stay alone. So it's really important to be able to stop and sometimes ask those questions. These are some, sorry, I'm gonna switch this here a little bit. There are times when you want to, um, when you stop and ask these questions, if children are having sudden changes. Um, as the, our presenter from the Christ Center of Tampa Bay mentioned that if there was a trauma that had been experienced, that maybe there is a sight or a smell or a movie that might trigger some things. But these are just some other examples that you might want to say, hey, maybe something else is going on. And that is they refuse to participate in routine tasks that they've always done. And all of a sudden now they're either refusing to do that or acting as though they can't do it, having trouble sleeping, having stomach aches, constipation. And again, you always want to rule out medical first. You want to make sure nothing medical is happening. But a lot of times when it comes to mental health, this is how we know something else is going on. They might seem moody, more agitated, more defiant. They have more challenging behaviors than usual. And maybe they are having more risky behaviors, trying to hurt themselves and, these, and hurting themselves on purpose. And these are in non-soothing ways. Again, you know your child and your loved one, so you know when something is a little bit more atypical. Maybe they never banged their head before, and now that's what they're doing. And maybe they're trying, they don't have the right words to be able to express what's happening. So a lot of times they're going to do that within their behaviors. So here are some tips to talk to your healthcare provider. One of the things that you might wanna do is if you feel like you're not, um, they just wanna focus on the, the behaviors. For example, maybe a child has uh, experiencing bullying at school and has not found the words or the, uh, the right way to express that to you so you know what's going on so you can take action, but it's through their behaviors. So oftentimes what happens is we want to go ahead and start a behavior intervention plan. And so the focus is on the contact, on the conduct rather than maybe what is actually happening within that child. So you might want to ask your healthcare provider, have you ever thought that um, about a mental health condition that my child might be experiencing? And then try to be detailed about what those behaviors are that you're seeing. Is it during a particular time of the day? Is it the more detailed you could be could help your healthcare provider be able to determine if there is something going on. With children with disabilities, when it comes to mental health, a lot of times they wanna treat that with medication. I'm not saying that all medications are bad, sometimes it's necessary, but there might be questions that you may wanna ask. Because again, we're sometimes working in two different silos. So on the mental health and the psychiatry side, they may not know what other medications your child is taking. So it's really important that you ask, will this contradict? Is there anything that I need to know about in terms of side effects? And be determined to find solutions. 
And I like to find a uh, focus on solutions because sometimes it's a journey to get there. Your loved one or child may not have the uh, ability to communicate exactly, to tell their healthcare professional. So you have to be that person, that advocate for them. And sometimes if you just treat it on the disability side and not the mental health side, you may not be finding the results that you want. So sometimes if you uh, might need to find another provider, one that's open to having those conversations and um, to help you get down to that uh, journey of finding the solution. So you're gonna wanna know what is the primary um, diagnosis. If they say um, we're diagnosing your child with um, you know, a conduct disorder. Okay, well, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And then of course, what are the possible causes of my child's condition, what maybe led us here? What are risks? What do I need to know about? What are the treatments? What if this treatment doesn't work? You're perfectly okay asking questions. The other thing you might wanna do is if you're going to um, a psychiatry office or a new provider is go in there ahead of time. Bring your child there so that they can see where it's at, bring a little more familiarity. Also, you can speak to the receptionist. You can ask, is there another waiting room that maybe is a little less quiet, I mean, more quiet, less stimulating uh, for your child? Also, maybe you ask for the first appointment of the day or the last appointment of the day. So it might not allow you to sit as long waiting for that appointment. And most importantly, um, cause less stress to your loved one. And then you really, at the end of the day, want to remind yourself that mental wellness is a journey. It's not a moment in time. It's a journey that we're all on. And just to stay encouraged, because as much as we work on our loved ones and the children with disabilities and getting their mental wellness, we need your mental wellness as well. And so knowing when to take time for you and if getting up before everybody else in the morning, taking five, 10 minutes and just enjoying the silence, then do that. Find what works for you. Reach out, develop a support system. Please know at Grace Point, we're here for you. My contact information is provided in the pamphlet and the booklet you have. Feel free to reach out if I could be of any assistance. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Erin, uh, Erin Seal Grandy. I'm from Seal Swim School. We have one in North Pinellas and one in Newport Ritchie. Um, and I am one of the owners there. Let's see here. So just a little bit about me. I've been a swim instructor since 1989, and I am a very big believer in teaching swimming to children, to all children, infants to adults, but also um, children with special needs is a very big part of what we do as well. So I've been part of the, um, the United States Swim School Association for many, many years. And in addition to that, I helped create a course where I teach swim teachers how to work with children with special needs in the water. So it's been a really beautiful journey in bringing in um, people who have never done that before to work with your children that have additional needs. Um, water safety and autism, why is drowning the leading death or cause of death for children on the spectrum? There are several reasons why children with autism are drawn to the water. As um, one of the ladies from CARD spoke about earlier, that the feeling of silence when they go in, the calming effects of it, the uh, pressure, the viscosity of the water and that added pressure, and it just looks amazing, especially in some of these days that are so incredibly hot right now, they just wanna go cool off and who can blame them? It's awful out there. Um, they, the water offers a lot of strong sensory seeking stimuli as well. So the sounds, the light, the splashing, the smells, even the silence, it just encourages these children to come, come to me. I want you to come play. And, um, as wonderful as it is, it is also incredibly dangerous. Um, drowning remains the leading cause of death for children with autism and accounts for approximately 90% of deaths associated with wandering or bolting by those of age 14 and younger. The biggest way to help um, keep your children safer around the water is to get them swimming lessons. Swimming lessons reduces the risk of drowning by 88%. 
you are literally giving your child the chance to fight when they are introduced to the water and how to be in the water safely. So if a child falls in the pool and has had no introduction to the water and has had no introduction to swimming lessons, typically if they fall in, they don't know what to do, they're going down and they're not fighting. A child who's been introduced to the water is going to fight. They're going to try and get on their back. They're gonna try and turn around and get the wall. They're gonna do everything they can to help themselves because they've been introduced to this before. Um, swimming lessons offer, and swimming in itself offers a recreational child, uh, activity that a child with ASD uh, can continue through adulthood. It's a wonderful sport and it's an equalizer with the typical population. Swim team is a beautiful um, equalizer because children with autism are able to compete but they're competing mostly against themselves and their last time. That's what they're working against. So it's really a neat sport also because a child with autism can join in and be in with a typical population as well. Some things that you can do to keep your child safer around the water. Um, make sure that you have every barrier, every bell, every whistle, every Everything that you can do, every lock and alarm to keep your child out of that pool when it's not, you're not in there with them. Um, I think Lisa was talking about earlier, making sure your neighbors, if your neighbor has a pool lanai that is constantly swinging open, you know that's going to be a safety risk for your child. That's when I say go to your neighbor's house and present them with a wonderful gift of a new lock and I will put it in personally for you. That's helping you take priority and making sure your child is safe um, and safer around. Um, if there's a body of water, a pond, a lake, retention in your backyard or your neighborhood, make sure that you have your fences up, your children understand the dangers of it, and that if it's the first place you look, if your child has gone missing, you go to the pool, you go to the pond, you go to the retention, all of that. And then once again, please learn CPR, first aid. CPR is so incredibly important. It can, it can save lives and, and it, just get your CPR. Oh, also, I always tell parents as well, if you can't save your child, you'll never forgive yourself. So simply, simply put, do what you can, because typically, unless you're in the medical field, 80% uh, of the people that do CPR is a family member. You, if you do CPR on someone. So please get your CPR so that you can help your child if God forbid something happens. And that's not just from drowning, that's from any, any kind of um, safety risk. And then just make it a priority for your children. Um, as far as swimming lessons are con concerned, Medicaid, Lisa um, has sent some wonderful resources recently that Medicaid it will actually pay for partial, partially pay for swim lessons. It depends on your insurance company and some offer a $50 voucher, some offer 150, you just have to call and find out, but highly, highly, highly recommend the swimming lessons as soon as possible. So when I first did this presentation back in 2019, a question was posed to me, how do I get this type of training for my child? And I, I was set back, I was like, oof. I can't even fathom a conference room of a hundred kids, let alone kids with disabilities, let alone 10 kids. So I kept racking my brain, racking my brain. What can I do to come up with something to teach kids? So thankfully where I work now, Achievability Therapy, my boss basically provided me with a great team and I posed my idea to her of creating animated safety videos of my daughter and it's a series that's going to be being safe with elena so because of the risks of drownings are usually between the ages of two and three this is my daughter at that age and this is the first animation video we just created so the concept of all the videos is going to be a side a and a side b going old school you know back to the 80s with the cassettes side a is going to be for the kid to watch side b is going to be for parents and caregivers to watch so this will be, I'm just gonna provide you the side A because you just sat through over an hour hearing us talk. So you don't need the side B right now.
Oh, here. Oh no, how could Elena be safe? Let's rewind and find out how. Mama, ball. Good job in telling me you wanted your ball, Elena. I'm so proud of you for asking mommy for help and not going outside alone by yourself. Thank you for letting me know that you wanted your ball, sweetie. How do you feel about taking swim lessons so we can be safe around the pool? Repeat after me. Josh the Otter. Josh the Otter. Water Safety Pledge. Water Safety Pledge. I promise to be a good son or daughter. I promise to be a good son or daughter. I promise to get an adult when I go near the water. I promise to get an adult when I go near the water. This will keep me safe like Josh the Baby Otter. This will keep me safe like Josh the Baby Otter. Thank you. Um, thank you. I want to say a special thanks to all my partners here for my panel here. I couldn't have done this without them. Special thanks to Raquel, my little Vanna. Here are my other sponsors. So when you exit here, you're going to have until, so we actually finished early, so which is good. Good. Hopefully the food vendors will be there. You guys can grab a, your quick lunch. At one o'clock, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office will be back here to conduct a safety net presentation. Um, there's also, you guys should have had a passport card that was given to you at registration. This is the resource bag that we will have free for you guys that will contain all this safety stuff to put at your home. So make sure you grab a bag. If you know of anybody that needs one, feel free to grab a second. Um, we're also going to have uh, the children's board. Uh, what are the boxes called, Raquel? I think there's family resource software. Yes. So they promote some information in those boxes. So make sure you grab one of those boxes as well. <clears throat> And my agency has that raffle right there. Um, how many places do they have to visit to qualify to go into the raffle? I believe on the passport it says 15. Okay. It's 
I just do know, but please you know, just make sure that you're going to as many as possible. Now what you're gonna do is bring those passports back because at two o'clock we're gonna be having a raffle for these lovely items that are showed here. You have to be present to win. And the passports are gonna be stamped <coughs> by the agencies that are there to resource them. And a lot of this, so my agency provided that first raffle and then the ones that you see in the PowerPoint, that is by CARDS Autism Services Fund. And they were the sponsor for the, your lunches as well. So when you see a card representative, like up here, make sure to thank them. Any questions? And actually, before we go into any questions, I want to introduce Councilman Vieira. He is here to support us, um, and Councilman Vieira is with the city of Kimba, council member. He is constantly supporting disability initiatives. Um, we have so much support from the city because of his leadership. He's constantly challenging uh, the city to come up with budgets to support activities, um, especially inclusion in all of our parks areas and inclusion all around. So he's a champion for you. He might want to make a couple of words. Thank you, Rick Allen. It's a great pleasure to be here. I see a lot of friends here. I see folks from CARD. I see my good friend Susan with Grace Point and, and other folks and, and, and so many other good individuals here. Uh, I know Tanya Lewis is here, always does great things in the community. Uh, but especially, I wanted to salute our friend, our former Tampa police officer, uh, Lisa Bunn, who just does such an amazing job. Let's give her a round of applause. You know, Lisa retired recently from the Tampa Police Department. We were so sad to see her go. Uh, she's really, when I think of what a cop is, a cop is a protector, a person who protects people in our community who need protecting. That's what Lisa does. And you know what? That's what she's still doing. Uh, but this endeavor here is so important. Some of y'all may know my older brother one is actually intellectually disabled. So for me, I'm very, very passionate about this issue. Uh, I can tell you all this. I mean, I, I, I think about my own mother. My mother just turned 75, uh, and she had some knee surgery that kind of went wrong, and she had to have some rehab because of an infection. She's been out for six weeks. And you know the biggest thing that pains her is? The fact that she can't see her oldest son, Juan, my brother, like she usually does. That's what pains her the most. So, you know, it's a lifelong commitment. All of us know that. But just know that there's a lot of good allies that y'all have in the local organizations like the ones that are represented here in local government, both Republicans and Democrats, in the faith community in so many places who've got it all back. So I just wanted to speak from the heart, I tell y'all I love you, and just say what a pleasure it is. And yes, I'm wearing a Blockbuster shirt. God bless Blockbuster. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So any questions before I explain the layout of the land for our party after this? And actually, before you uh, start explaining the layout of the land, I also wanted to um, add to the water safety. And one of our former uh, events, one of the presenters talked about how drowning can happen, especially for little ones, in two inches of water. Think about having a bucket, right? The kid wants to play in the bucket, they bend over the top heavy. Two inches of water can actually lead to drowning. So we just need to be cognizant and considerate of that. I know, unfortunately, there was an incident within this last year of a, um, a child drowning in a horse trough. So again, we're talking about big bodies of water with pools and lakes and things like that, but we also need to be considerate of, of other types of water that might be um, attracting the little ones. Yes, yeah, so since we're close to the end of the year, um, if you go back to the registry and ask them, please add me to Lisa's disability listserv, you will get such plethora of information from me all the time. I just sent out a lot of the free swim lessons because since I depleted all of the, the vouchers that they had, which is great you know, melts my heart that people are taking this opportunity and getting their kids swim lessons. Just make sure you go up to the front, let them know you want to join my disability listserv and you will be for future reference any swim because Hillsborough County, all the advocates in the area know I push swim safety. That's why obviously my first animation was about swim safety. It's such a preventable, you know, lesson we just have to push it. We're just surrounded by too much water being here in Florida. So just make sure to let them know. 
Also on CARD's website for the 14 counties that we provide services to, there's a link to tell you where you can get some lessons, special needs, some lessons, and those free from lessons by county on our website. So when you exit out the doors, immediately to your left are the restrooms. There's going to be coolers set out all over the place because I want you guys hydrated. Again, safety, safety. I don't, you know, I don't think I want to do mouth to mouth on anybody. I don't want to get COVID again. Um, on the outside, you're going to see the specialty units from the Tampa Police Department and the Hillsborough County Sheriff just to see what type of search and rescue materials and resources are out there. When you go straight ahead, that was our kid activity area. Hang a left and you're gonna go towards the end. You're gonna have two hallways. The left is gonna be privately for families that wanna register to their kids with the Tampa Police Department or the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. They're gonna have a crime scene technician from each agency to photograph your child and you can register them right there on the spot. Hang a right, that's gonna be where the resource room. Just make sure you come back at one o'clock to, to witness the demonstration of uh, safety net. Some families may not have um, uh, their child with them. You can still go ahead and register if you want to. Um, take that opportunity. Or you can also leave the information if you don't necessarily want it with mine. But you don't necessarily have your loved one with you today. Okay. Well, the sheriff's office, you will have to provide a photograph. So, any questions? All right, go have fun. You're welcome.